So moving into the tectosilicates, um, the first thing that we're going to discuss here is quartz. And you'll notice that I have so many different samples here because quartz can look a lot of different ways. There are lots of different um, crystal habits that it likes to grow in and it can grow in lots of different environments. And that's why we see a multitude of different colors, different structures and things like that. And you'll notice that um, across the board, except for with this sample here, all of these are pretty transparent. So being able to see through the sample is one of those dead giveaways that we might be looking at quartz, but your probably first thought is, oh gosh, another transparent mineral. How am I going to distinguish this from the other transparent mineral minerals that we've seen so far? So things like bayrite, fluorite, everything like that. And we'll talk about that right now. So with these two right here, they're a really great example of um, this hexagonal prism on the sides, right? We can count one, two, three, four, five, six sides here. And then we have a termination at the end, which isn't quite a hexagonal prism. Um, I think it would be rhombohedral prism in certain ways, but um, what we have usually here is this well-defined hexagonal prism around the C-axis. And then we have some kind of termination, and you can see that these aren't very well formed, right? It's not a perfect hexagonal shape. But regardless, having this and then having these nice see-through shapes is really indicative of something like quartz. If we think back to uh, corundum, where we had that same hexagonal prism around the sides, but instead of having a termination like this, we had like a pinacoid, so a flat face on the top, that's gonna be a little bit different. So that could help you out there. Um, another thing is that this doesn't actually just grow in these kinds of nice, beautiful hexagonal crystals. We can also have um, this kind of massive form. So this would be rose quartz, um, that kind of pinky color. And you can't see any well-defined crystal faces here, right? It's kind of just, there's not a good shape. So this would be like a massive form um, or polycrystalline, something like that. And with this piece, another thing to note is that this is a great example of quartz's cleavage, which it doesn't have any. So quartz actually doesn't have any cleavage. And so these irregular fractured surfaces, we would call this conchoidal fracturing, where it kind of looks like the glass at the bottom of like a fish tank or something like that. This is super indicative of quartz and not something you're going to see in bayrite or in fluorite. So that can help you determine um, whether or not you're looking at quartz or another transparent mineral. We also have this piece here. This would be a piece of jasper that's very nice. Um, another example of something like this would be this um, chalcedony that we have here, like river quartz. And both of these, the environments that they form in, the quartz crystals themselves are very, very tiny. These form in like aqueous environments, hydrothermal veins, things like that. And so these are really, really tiny crystals. We're not going to be able to see any crystal faces like we do in here, but we still maintain that conchoidal fracturing um, and all of the other physical properties that quartz has as well. And this is going to be the most colorful example that you'll see where the crystals are so fine that it almost looks opaque, right? But if we were to powderize this, everything would still be transparent. Now going into this one here, I'm sure you all know what this purple quartz would be called. We usually um, colloquially refer to this as amethyst. So that's the purple quartz here. And it still has that transparency that we can see and then we can also kind of see some of those terminations here and a little bit of that crystal shape. Um, this is a really nice sample. But we can also see conchoidal fracturing right here when we look at this broken edge. And if you'll notice, other than these two, and even a little bit with this amethyst, quartz generally tends to be really light in color. If we look at this sample here, we can see that there's just the tiniest bit of color, but in general, we'll see pale colors more likely than we will, something that's really dark. Um, an exception to this could be something like smoky quartz, and that might just be a little bit darker, but always transparent. Pretty cool. 
And so another thing to help you decide is the hardness of this. So quartz should be harder than our glass plate here. Let's give it a go with this amethyst, mainly just because this is easy for me to hold. And so we'll expect this to produce a really good streak. So let's see. Nice. That's a pretty darn good scratch. And so that's another way that you can help distinguish this from something like fluorite, which would not produce this really nice scratch mark on glass. So harder than glass, it's not going to effervesce with anything like HCl. Um, it forms in these really nice crystal forms. If we streak it, it should be white. We'll give it a go. Even with this pink one here, let's give it a go. So the thing about streaking is that um, to actually produce a color in there, you need to have a lot of color actually in the crystal itself. All of these little pastel colors that we see here just tell us that we don't actually have a lot of color impurities that are happening there. So if you can see just ever so lightly, there is a white streak, but the hardness of this is pretty darn close to the hardness of our streak plate as well. So we may be powderizing the sample a little bit and the streak plate at the same time, but in general, we do have like a white streak. You can see it there on my finger. But so even if we scratch or streak all of these, they will still produce a white streak. So that's pretty indicative and going to be pretty common in the tectosilicates group altogether. So let's see, we talked about habit, hardness, cleavage, there's none. The specific gravity of quartz for everything in the tectosilicate family, specific gravity or density is not really going to help us distinguish it from other things. If we think about um, something like sulfur, where you could have a yellow piece of quartz, I suppose, that resembled sulfur. Um, sulfur is going to have a much lower specific gravity or density than this quartz crystal will. And so that could help you out. But in general, this is just moderately low density. All of these are, except for maybe some with some impurities in it. But really, they're not dense. They're not incredibly light. They're somewhere in the middle. And I think that's everything that we have for quartz.